a co-founder of Cornerstone Advisors, Steve Williams heads up the firm's industry-leading strategic planning and facilitation practice and is actively involved in many of Cornerstone's technology planning and performance improvement engagements. Steve has assisted hundreds of banks and credit unions in their efforts to become highly efficient, top-performing financial institutions. An experienced private banker with a formal commercial and consumer credit background, Steve's more than 25 years of industry experience have provided him a deep working knowledge of bank operations and delivery systems, particularly in lending processes. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Steve Williams. Out of love to Getty Lee and the, and the Neil Peart and the Alex Lifeson. Thank you very much. Hello, CSI family! Woo! I come to you on a spiritual mission, very similar to the CSI leaders. I like causing trouble for the big box banks, uh, and so does everyone at my company. So I'm very, very glad to be here. Appreciate the invite from the CSI leadership, and thanks for uh, letting me share some things. Uh, the, co the topic I want to talk about is taking some of these key trends we've heard about this morning and bringing it back to good old leadership. So I'm asking you for the next 45 minutes or so to kind of do a Cosmo quiz, self-assessment of you, of your leadership team, and of your whole team back at the bank. I want you to think about, are we ready to lead in this new world of banking? And for that, guys, I want you to maybe take a couple notes as we go. I want you to use the Jack Welsh quote about leadership that I think is a great filter. He says that leaders passionately own the vision number one, and relentlessly see it to execution. So I love the word passionate for vision. I love the word relentless for execution. And part of our message today is, is that the Cornerstone team, we travel hundreds of days on the road, thousands of days combined, and we want to talk about what are some of the leaders in terms of execution doing out there, not at Chase and not at B of A, but in entrepreneurial institutions like you. So I hope uh, you find it useful. I want to share some of the things <coughs> And uh, uh, I have a, an associate here as well, Sam Kilmer, who's one of uh, our senior directors. Sam, can you raise your hand maybe for me? Do a shout out. He's in the back there. And everybody at Cornerstone, we use the word gonzo bankers. You may have read our blog or our newsletter. What we mean by that term is kind of troublemakers. We like bankers who don't take the status quo. We like bankers who don't get lulled into sleep by buzzwords, but they're very creative, they're very ambitious, they're always striving for the next improvement. Uh, and we really like to find and celebrate the gonzo bankers that are both on the bank side and on the vendor and innovator side, the ones who disrupt the big companies, make things different. And one of the things we talk about a lot inside of Cornerstone is the difference today between financial capital and strategic capital. So the first thing I want leaders to do going forward is think about both balance sheets. In terms of financial capital, our regulators have buttoned that up great. We've got good asset quality, earnings are back, and the, and the net worth of the banking industry is now over 10%. We've never had this much financial capital. But there is another balance sheet that we'd call the strategic capital side, and it goes to all the competition, all the innovation and disruption out there. Where are we strategically in terms of our ability to be relevant, to grow revenue, to compete with these new competitors? And that comes down to things like, have we really solidified our business model? Do we have a strong brand out there? Do we have the right culture to execute? Are we innovating enough in terms of products, channels, customer experience? And our take right now, guys, and it's not to be mean, is that we, and we'd include ourselves in this industry, we get an A on financial capital and a C on strategic capital. A B overall, but we've got a problem in one class, and we've got to work on that a great deal. And part of that, we think, is, where the, is how we focus our day, how we focus our time, and especially how do we focus our leadership optics. And I want you to kind of think about your day-to-day -day and how you lead your organizations. I know you're competitive folks, because either you're an executive who approved your own budget to get here, or somebody thinks you're good enough to approve the travel and conference budget for you to come here. So I know you're competitive, and you want to win, and you like to achieve things, 
what I'd encourage you to think about is how much time are we spending running the bank on a day-to-day -day basis, working on our budgets and our variance reports, running IT, responding to audit and compliance uh, comments, going to loan committee, the grand room full of bald men with gray hair loan committee, um, looking at our business production, and how much time on the other side of the ledger, instead of running the bank, are we spending changing the bank, making it better, doing things like looking at new innovation opportunities or experiments, uh, doing, uh, putting together a very strong strategic plan, managing change, putting new systems in place, putting new products out the door, forming new strategic partnerships. When you think about that, we have a theory. We are very disciplined at running the bank. We hate audit requirements or exceptions. We are very undisciplined at changing the bank. And the leaders in the future are going to be very clear about thinking about that right side of the ledger and saying, how do we get better at that? How do we get more relentless at how we make the bank better day to day? And I'd ask you to look at those processes on the right side here and say, are we really good at that stuff today? Or can we get better? Our take is when we find a best practice over here, it's rare, but we want to try to you know, band those together and think about how do we get better at changing the bank. So let's talk about some of the things that are out there and what we see leaders starting to do. The first big kind of elephant in the room is what happens to the branch. This is the latest numbers uh, on branch count from SNL. As you can see, we had another year in 14, the June numbers, where it went down again to below 95,000. Peak numbers of branches was in about 2009. And uh, of course, you can see during that time, deposits have continued to grow. We have 10 trillion deposits domestically now in the banking industry. What I would, important to note though, is this transition away from branches or the role of the branches started actually in the early 2000s in terms of occupancy cost or revenue. That's been going down now for 10 years. And it's not because number of branches, it's because the square footage in the average branch and how we're kind of running that. So our take on this is if we're losing about 1,000 branches a year and we're at 95,000, we don't think the last branch is going to close 95 years from now. We think that pace is going to accelerate and the size of the branch and the shape of the branch is going to shift. And we see that in the numbers right now. Uh, we, we talk anecdotally about is traffic moving down, but at Cornerstone we do a lot of quantitative benchmarking of banks and credit unions. And what we find is, uh, here is from our recent bank study, the average branch used to do in 2008 over 10,000 transactions a month. Now it's down to about 7,000. That's a pretty big move in, in four years worth of data. So with that traffic starting to go away, we have an issue, and that is the good old journey we've been on since I was a marketing intern at a bank in 1986, products per household or share of wallet. That actually has been slightly going down in the last few years as we've been focusing on things like sales culture and trying to grow revenue. And one of the reasons is, you know, we, we're seeing that in the new account opening numbers as well. Be happy to give you a copy of this presentation. I hope it's up on the server or the, the website. But we're seeing both in <clears throat> new accounts and in checking fees and things like that, what we would call retail organic growth. That in the old days, people like Kerry Killinger from WAMU or Vernon Hill from Commerce Bank would go to the quarterly uh, earnings calls every time and say, we're growing checking accounts, we're growing fee income. We're seeing much more of a plateauing of that across all sizes in the banking industry. And of course, what we're worried about is, is it this? About a month ago, I was getting ready for work, and I'm kind of weird. My favorite show is Squawk Box on CNBC. And there was an analyst putting a buy rating on Everbank, as you know, a fairly innovative, primarily internet-based uh, bank. Uh, and they asked, why are you putting a buy on Everbank? And this was his quote. I had to write it down. It was, he said, you know, and you got to picture an arrogant investment guy from New York. My own mother even pays bills on a mobile phone and never goes to those expensive mausoleums you see all over town like the traditional banks. And I heard that shaving and I went, not that uh, I haven't heard that before, but this is becoming such a part of the mainstream thinking. And once that kind of thinking starts to mainstream, behavior will come next. Uh, and I think it's very important, leaders right now are the ones who are saying, guys, this is not emerging, this is not fringe, this is core now to competition and our business model. And I think a picture, we all have to start evangelizing inside our banks 
is the picture of what has really changed right before us. When Steve had us be rock stars this morning with 800 smartphone screens facing him, he's talking about this social dynamic that's changed. We all grew up in banking with a simple formula. We'd have traditional media marketing, the Sunday CD ad, the Sunday loan ad, the billboard on I-5. And we would use that traditional marketing to drive people into the branch. And when they got there at the teller line on their platform, we would start to cross sell. We do teller referrals, we do profiling at the platform, and we built an entire industry on this. Sales trainers, fee income consultants, marketing consultants, all around this idea. And we saw the folks like B of A and WAMU and, and Commerce Bank all execute this model flawlessly for a good decade or 15 years. But here's what's changed with those 800 smartphones that we pointed at Steve this morning, is that uh, now most consumers will grab the smartphone the very first time they feel a pang or a hunger or a need for anything in life, they will start with mobile and social search. And these days it's not just the branch, of course, it's multi-channel fulfillment and being personal or being personalized does not necessarily mean driving in a car to the branch down by Arby's to get physical. And additionally, once we are in the branch, it's not just about products. Think about when you go to the AT&T or Verizon store to get a new quote product or upgrade. They don't just hand you a product, they configure you. They move your address book, they move your photos, they get your Facebook reset up, they put insurance on the baby. More and more we have to configure our customers into all of our channels, the digital channel especially, and once they're there and once they're configured with alerts and bill pay and mobile banking, then we start to give them engagement through digital marketing. And that's why Salesforce paid a lot of money for its marketing cloud exact target and this whole world of engagement in the digital. So I know when you guys see what, what's happening with your financial service providers, most engagement today is not in person, even when it's very personalized, and even it's when it's giving a high level of, of customer experience. What I'd ask you to do, have you guys talked about this change enough at the executive suites and set out a plan that says, what are we gonna do about this? And we know we have these brands out here, and we hear this, uh, and the Viacom study was very famous that Steve quoted. Here's another one from Accenture, saying basically consumers love stuff. If it's cool, they'll take it. They don't care about the charter or the historical lineage of whether it's a bank or not a bank. They just want their need addressed. And so we see these great brands out there and these companies that focus on design and execution and say, wow, that's kind of scary. What will we do? And I think classically what we want to do is not be uh, Netflixed like we were Blockbuster. What a great chart though. Talk about old model, new model, Blockbuster versus Netflix and the two stock prices. Now, it's important to note, let me try to use the pointer. It may not work, everybody stand back. Oh, it didn't work. Uh, here's the pointer. Right about here, you can see where Blockbuster was peaking. They had 9,000 stores in America. Of course, now the number is zero. Now imagine being at the strategic planning that summer of 2003 when they had 9,000 stores, were profitable, one of the, a very strong consumer brand. Do you think they were saying, guys, we are about to tank? I mean, we should, you know, they were probably very buoyant and optimistic about things. And what I want you to think about as leaders, and one of the most important things is picking up on what we call the weak signals at Cornerstone. No, they don't have market share yet. No, yes, some of the early adopters are the ones using the product right now but that doesn't mean we should discount them. And there was a lot of flawed strategic assumptions at Blockbuster in 2003, 2004 that were out there about how fast technology might be adopted or how strong new brands could be. What I ask you right now, think about what are the weak signals that our management team might be ignoring right now? And what do we need to do about it? And how do we monitor weak signals to see what is fluff? Account aggregation in 1999 was fluff. But what's real? Mobile banking 2009 through 2014 has been real. And I think what's important too, when we look about what, what we do and what's going on out there with all these disruptors, is to basically understand that you and I will be under attack competitively in a very harsh way for the rest of our careers. Uh, in, in a nutshell, we are intermediaries. We gather in deposits and we lend it out and we also intermediate payments 
and we intermediate the second mor secondary mortgage market. We get paid for intermediation. And all these disruptors in the middle, whether they be funding disruptors, lending disruptors, or non-interest income disruptors, have one opinion of us, the traditional banking and credit union industries, we are overpaid as intermediaries. And the rest of our careers will about disruptors saying, you are overpaid, we would like to take a slice of this through specialization, through leveraging digital technology, through leveraging new models, and we would like to do it better, faster, cheaper. And what we're going to have to do is two things. We're going to have to continue to get more efficient because it costs us about 3% non-interest in, interest expense to intermediate. Uh, and we're going to have to keep adopting some of these disruptive new models to stay relevant. But think about yourself. Intermediation will melt for the rest of our careers. What are we doing uh, to address that strategically as leaders? And let's just look at some of the disruptors, what we can expect in the landscape in the years ahead. So we see mobile banking, and you see great players like USAA uh, in the last 20 years has gone from 2 billion to 63 billion without substantially building branches. Um, and we'll talk about them later. Probably the only institution out there who is, has taken banking, insurance, and investments, and all has it today through one mobile app. So I can check my auto claim and check my bank balance and check my investment stock prices all through one mobile app. But there's other players out there like Ally. You don't need a bank, you need a quote, Ally is their branding, or we don't have branches, but we give you the money and savings, uh, who are saying that we are gonna be mobile category killers and try to drive this, not with uh, anything special but price. And as rates go up, look for mobile players like Ally to do exactly what ING Direct did with higher rates as we head up the curve on interest rates. So what do we have to do there? We, we're gonna have to know that that price competition is coming with funding in the future, and we're gonna have to ask the question, how do we compete with them on experience? What makes our deposits and our relationships a bit more sticky on the way? Just a couple weeks ago, Walmart, always feared by bankers, introducing GoBank. Uh, importantly here, they're saying, we know you've tried and scratched your head and worked with the FDIC and you can't make the underbank market work. We will take it, thank you. And so what do we have to do here? We have to monitor how profitable can Walmart make the underbanked and when does that become an innovation that starts creeping up into the mainstream side and should we jump into certain niches around here sooner rather than later uh, before they figure things out in terms of how to deliver uh, and go after our payments business fairly hard. And of course, this is the, uh, the big one that kind of made us shake about three weeks ago. Uh, and it is truly game on now with mobile payments. We think we will look back to September 9th and not necessarily say this was the one payment thing that survived, but it was the day where this new player entered and everybody started scrambling. Have you ever seen so many people in the payments industry scramble so hard as the week of September 9th and still this morning? And so everybody involved is still understanding how this will impact things, but we have woken up and now every credible technology vendor and bank CEO needs a strategy for this. Think about all the things now we have to handle and then we add marketing. Uh, this is a great example of, of that idea I said about we no longer go for branch traffic, we immediately grab search. Uh, this is where I live in Scottsdale, Arizona, was walking down the street with my Trulia app. Uh, I said, what if I wanted to buy a house? I use my location services. Right by me was a house for $179,000 and right there it says there's my payment and hey Steve, why don't you get pre-qualified? And of course those click right into landing pages for Wells Fargo. I'm not saying the average community bank can afford a page on Zillow to compete with Wells Fargo, but what we are saying is our marketing leaders, our marketing department, our marketing uh, advisors and agencies need to get us in the middle of this new world of search because that's where revenue volume is gonna come from. And I think sometimes as community banks, we think that's okay because we're not a big box retail bank. We compete more on the business, commercial, commercial real estate, small business side of things. I think we all know we can't be too, uh, too comfortable here. There is a lot of technology coming to the small business owner now. In the last 10 years, there's been a lot of older CEOs and small businesses retiring, and guess who takes over? Uh, junior or the daughter or someone younger, and they've had an iPhone now for six or seven years. They have a tablet for a few years, 
And this is a great study done this year in 14 by uh, Eighth Power, which basically said now 37, uh, 66 percent of small businesses might go somewhere else if there's a better mobile offering. And when they shop banks, only 30, uh, 37 percent or more than a third of bankers didn't even mention mobile channels as part of the small business offerings today. So I think what's very important, and we're seeing this with things I put intentionally up here, Wells Fargo Mobile CEO, Commercial Electronic Office, probably the rabbit to chase in business services. Uh, but I think it's important as leaders, we go back to our commercial lenders and say, guys, this is real, this is here. We've got to work with our partners to be on the game with mobile small business and mobile commercial. That old internet product alone won't do it anymore. What's our timeline to get that implemented? And then importantly, what's our timeline to put that in the head of our business bankers? Because they still, 15 years after we wanted business bankers to focus on more in terms of relationships uh, and uh, not just lending, we still see a huge focus on credit. And this is somebody else's job in most commercial lenders' mind. We've got to change that mindset as leaders. This is the relationship banker going forward. This is as or more important than credit a few years from now. So well, the big thing we want you to focus on our, our clients in say 2014, 2015 to get started is a term we use at Cornerstone called delivery redirect. And what we mean by that is we can't do everything. We have a balance sheet and income statement and we have limited resources to affect change. And so instead of being an observer more of a leader and an executor, we think it's important right now to start a journey. And this journey could take 10 years, but we've got to get started now about redirecting our channels, redirecting our resources, and importantly, redirecting how we run the organization to not be blockbuster. And we may not be completely digital in the future, but we know it's going to be a lot farther towards digital than it is this morning or this afternoon. And so we think it's about resources, it's about changing the way you produce revenue, and it's about new organizational capabilities that we don't have today. When we look at the experiments going on right now, we think they're great. And we would say, there's no real one playbook that works here. You've got to tie this to your strategy. Um, but a couple things we would say. Uh, do not get hormonal about new self-service technology. We don't like to make hormonal business decisions uh, at Cornerstone, we like to think about what is the business case and how does that uh, fit with our strategy. So a very famous case study up here is Coastal Credit Union in Raleigh, North Carolina, about a $3 billion credit union who does not have a physical teller line in any branch today. They're very famous that they have pooled all their tellers using Eugenius machines now owned by NCR where people come in and talk to a teller pool uh, through video. It's gotten a lot of play. And we think this is one of many technologies that you can look at in your branches. But again, it depends on who are your customers, what is your strategy going forward. Uh, in this case, Coastal was able to you know, train its, its members, as they would call them. But this isn't going to be, in our opinion, what all retail banking is going forward. What we like to say for this kind of technology is look at your business case. Make sure there's a, a takeaway in efficiency, or if it's not efficiency, is there an added value that this kind of stuff adds? Uh, it does add value if all of a sudden the, the branch is closed and I still have this uh, uh, automated teller that can help me bank from, say, 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock at night through the centralized teller pool. That's an add to the customer. It's an access piece. Uh, I've looked at recent payroll reports at your banks, and the tellers aren't the biggest problem in terms of payroll cost. Um, we have whittled down teller staffing, and we continue to do so. And we'll always have to look at that expense. Um, but these days, when we look at small footprint branches that may have as few as four people, and those four people have been turned into more universal associates, and they are armed and ready with Check 21, and cash recyclers and instant issue card machines uh, and very good workflow in terms of new account opening and they have other roles in terms of onboarding customers and making outbound calls, that thing can be pretty darn efficient at 2,000 square feet compared to just going complete automation and hoping you don't alienate folks going forward. So what we'd say is we applaud the experiments. If I was a CEO today, I would be looking for some place to stick a video terminal just to start watching what happens. 
but you can't, make, you can't cost justify it at one video terminal. You probably need to do a dozen before you start getting any kind of efficiency from a staffing perspective. And for most of you, that's a really big move to make right now. But what I do think is important is to understand where do your branches fit into the overall strategy and what should they look like. But when we talk about physical branch versus digital, I think one thing we really want to start driving home with bankers is it's not about transactions. It's about interactions and revenue production. Even the biggest loser bank in the country is going to migrate physical teller transactions to digital for things like looking up a balance, transferring money, doing a bit of simple maintenance to the account. Everybody's going to do that. That is no advantage. That is not staying relevant. You could still work your way into a sale and oblivion by doing that. But the winners, the ones that will stay relevant, will start thinking about how do we move revenue production across all channels? How do I generate new accounts, new loans, deepen relationships, not just through the physical location, but through outbound professionals armed with technology, through my contact center, and of course through the internet and mobile channels uh, more and more. If we look at most banks today, their revenue production outside of the branch other than high-end commercial officers is pretty miserable. And we think about where that's going to go, we think there's going to be huge opportunity. And we look at best practice folks, some of the large credit unions out there, some of the retail banks, they're getting a lot more production now through the contact centers, through the digital channels than most entrepreneurial community banks are doing today. It is a huge opportunity, and it's not just for the big guys. We have folks, $200 million, who are starting to experiment across channels today and moving that revenue production. So to kind of break out of things, I'd like you to imagine a time when you look at your staffing at the bank and you have as many people in your contact center and supporting your digital channel as you do in your branches. So I don't think your branches necessarily go away. You've heard folks like Brett King talk about banking 3.0 and banking's an app, it's not a place you go. Don't worry about the branch of the future. We think for most, with a legacy business or an existing business, that's too extreme of a message. But we think most folks think the digital is going to go from 0 to 10 or 20 percent, and physical is going to keep the, the dominant. We think it's more like 50-50. And we bankers are not moving fast enough more to a 50-50, not a transactions, of revenue production in the future. And that's going to be a stairmaster we think you're going to have to climb that's going to be very hard. It's going to take a lot of new skills. And so when we talk about delivery channels, uh, when you hear a cliche in our industry, we just want to give the customer the channel of their choice. And actually, we think that's stupid. We think it's stupid because if you ask them, they will want everything. If you've ever asked a Gen Wire where he wants ATMs, it's on every corner of the street. Uh, and he would like you to pay for those. Uh, if I, if they ever asked me as I was walking by a Blockbuster store in 2004, would you like us to close this store? I would have said, nah, keep it open. I might get a wild hair one. I'm going to Safeway and, and, and maybe get a video. because, But it didn't cost me anything to say that. Again, you have finite resources and you have a lot focused on occupancy and branch staff. There is going to be a, a, a redirect there. And you have to decide what choices do we have to make and which customers do we want to please the most? And which customers can we let go because they don't fit our particular model? And tied to that is the fact that we don't just sell products. This was brought up by Steve this morning with, with products like Uber. But think about this when you talk about leadership and what our priorities should be inside the bank. The customers buy an experience today. It sounds cliche, but when you bring it back to what does that mean for us, you look at folks like Amazon who've never had a billboard or necessarily a TV commercial or traditional marketing that got their brand out there. Everybody got the brand perception of Amazon by using it and then telling people about it and then getting signed up for Prime and then becoming an evangelist for Amazon Prime. The experience starts to sell itself in these new business models. And we are getting consumers very trained on very cool experiences that leverage the digital model. And their expectations for banking, as Steve mentioned this morning, are going up, 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 up. But think about our day-to-day -day at the executive suites. How often do we focus on lending, on, on budgets, on finance, on risk? 
How much do we talk in those executive suites airtime about the customer experience, about our metrics that drive that, about what is wrong down in the trenches with our experience processes today? Amazon manages their business with over 200 customer experience metrics. They're fanatical about every click, about every screen. They constantly, all day long, are doing A-B testing on did this screen work better than this one? Which consumers had the better ease of use and the better uptake of their usage? Think how much we have to change our mojo as managers thinking about customer experience and how much airtime are we giving to this uh, versus other things at the bank? And a quiz I'd give you is, what are the three most broken processes in your organization today from a customer experience standpoint? Do you know which ones and do you know why and what the gaps are either in training or systems or process or the good old compliance policy that we have that's getting into the way of that? What's really scary sometimes is we don't even know what the points of pain are that we should be fixing. And that's a big part of what the leaders are going to start driving their company to. They're going to say, as important as that audit exception, as important as that budget variance on travel and expense, because the CSI conference is the process that's not working today around mobile bill pay, or the process that stinks on, on mortgage loan origination, or the fact that we kill all our commercial loans with one process, even if it's 200000 versus $2 million. We've got to go after those things using the Jack Welsh word, relentlessly now going forward. And we think you're going to have to divest some things to invest in others. You're going to have to lead that grand redirect in your organization and have the real discussion. And to do that, we think you have to agree as a management team and get the support of your board of directors to say, what is our delivery channel strategy going to look like? It's our belief there's not one size fits all. There's not one bank 3.0 that's perfect. There's not one model that, that uh, can generate the most value. We would say there's a whole spectrum from a bank that wants to stay very physically focused. That could be maybe in Laredo, Texas, near the border. This could be a group that banks Hispanics, has a lot of branch traffic, has a lot of fee income, does international remittances and check cashing and small dollar loans, all the way to the digital forte of folks like Ally who want to be completely uh, digital. We've had some clients actually tell us, in 10 years, we plan to be completely digital. And of course, that's not true for everybody. Uh, let me give you an example and how that translates into the law of finite resources and costs and the decisions that you have to make. Uh, we take a look sometimes at a measure. If you know the efficiency ratio, things like 65 is a good or 60 is a good efficiency ratio. 60 says we spend 60 cents of non interest expense to earn a dollar of revenue. We take a slice of that efficiency ratio of what is the occupancy of cost um, or the premise and equipment cost, as they call it, to revenue in different organizations. So here's three examples. Umqua Bank, the self-declared world's greatest bank. They came up with that tagline themselves. They, they did a poll of one bank and said, we are the world's greatest bank. Thank you very much. Um, but known, of course, in the industry. Very community, very store-oriented, very neighborhood-oriented. They spend 11% of their revenue on premise and equipment. At the same time, somebody like Silicon Valley Bank, one of the great commercial banking stories in the history of banking, Silicon Valley focuses on technology, life science, and the wine industry exclusively. They have high-priced, outbound, networked relationship managers. The average deposits per branch at Silicon Valley Bank is over a billion dollars. How would you like to be that branch manager? Come on in. I've got a billion dollars of deposits in the vault. Um, but they spend about 3% of their occupancy because they've got high-priced people out in Silicon Valley and other markets. And then, of course, there's that category killer, USAA, who spends less than 1% of their revenue on premise equipment or occupancy. Think about that. 1% compared to Umqua's 11%. Where are they pouring the other 10% of revenue at a $63 billion organization? Uh, think about your IT staff for a minute. Some of you have Tim, Sally, Mary, and Rob. They have 5,000 people in their IT department that help support 12,000 people in their call center to give you a feeling for just you know, what their organization looks like. Those two departments dominate most of the entire organization. A big old call center with a big old IT department is how USA does it. Now you're probably thinking, and Sam provoked me on this, 
Well, if you take community banks, and I define those just for grins as, say, a billion dollars and under just to get a gearing, the average community bank, if I take all that across, uh, all banks across the country, about 8% premise and equipment expense to revenue is wh where you guys fall in. So a little less than an Umqua, more than a Silicon Valley bank, and about 10 times the occupancy of USAA. But I think you can see that it's important to you guys to figure out your model and where do you want to spend branches and branch staff and other things. And we want you basically as leaders to talk about and think about leading what we call the great redirect. Uh, a great redirect of resources and strategy that's going to happen in the next five to ten years. So we think there's going to be a reduction in these things. There will be less branch square footage. Maybe not the number of branches at your institution. Some of you guys are sticking it to the big box banks right now. So if you have seven branches, I bet your strategic plan says you're going to have 14, and I would probably bet on you. But they're probably going to be smaller branches. You'll have less teller staff because you'll more, be more tied to smaller branches, universal associate staff, who's a blend of service and sales, as we get more customers configured into the digital channels to pump their own gas. You won't have people answering the phone and giving a balance and saying, yes, Betty, your Social Security check did post on the 3rd. Uh, instead, you will have more people engaging to drive revenue. The good old ATM, just get the cash. That is going to continue to melt like an ice cube as it has for the last 15 years. If you look at transactions per ATM, they continue to go down. And you're going to go after your legacy contracts, whether that be telecom or bill pay or anything else, to keep freeing up money to move over. And where do you think you'll be investing? And I'd ask you, think about how are we driving and managing this new portfolio of innovation around mobile around universal branch staff and the training that goes with that, around branch efficiency technology like instant issue cash recyclers, workflow systems to do lending, uh, around new outbound calling, uh, and around things like unifying uh, your digital channels around voice and chat and video and now messaging, uh, doing more e-marketing, and then getting somehow into the world of experimenting payments with things like mobile payments, P2P. You think about that, that's a big budget that we have to work on, a big investment that we have to affect at our bank. And for the last four years in banking, as a whole, revenue has been flat. We've been doing a lot of work on the hamster wheel, but because of margin compression, the revenue in the banking industry is flat, and we have to invest in that right side of things to stay relevant and stay competitive and keep driving revenue. So we have no choice but to make hard choices. And, and really focus on that reduce and redirect. So I'd ask you how clear is what you've decided in your strategy to reduce and how clear is the redirect and how much are you managing and actively and relentlessly managing that redirect going forward? How much is it one strategy versus the HR strategy over here, the mobile strategy over here, the branch strategy over here? How much is it one strategy tied to who you want to be? And a key tool in that that is very simple, that we have trouble finding in a lot of banks, is a good old channel scorecard. If your business was shifting from one channel to the other, and that was one of the big narratives in your industry, do you think one of the easiest reports to find in a bank would be, well, let's see what's going on in our channels. So we like to do some of this for folks. We, we've gotten a lot of our clients into this at the executive level, and we even share this information with the board of directors. Boards love this stuff. But at the top, it, you take your channels and say, OK, what's happening on the number of transactions across all our various channels? You see the whole world of deposits as an example. We've been doing most of our deposit taking in branches. The two most popular transactions in branches today, check deposit and check deposit with cash back. Uh, think about, are we shifting that to the ATM, to the great uh, case study this morning that was given about shifting to consumer remote deposit and 5,400 transactions. Do you put that in the face of your executive team? But then not just look at transactions, look at the sales value of things. Where are you producing new deposit accounts, new loans? And then look at the overall cost of your channels. We think leaders are going to know where are the transactions for convenience for my customers, where is the sales occurring for production and revenue growth, and where is the cost? And based on looking at those three dimensions, you will get better at leading the redirect because you'll have the information to go, holy crap, I didn't know we'd invested in all that online account opening and we're only taking 
145 mortgage applications. You can start to debate and argue and talk about what's going on there in terms of this shift and are we really making progress fast enough. So I want to kind of leave, uh, go through for a few minutes and, and really kind of now take this back to that Cosmo quiz and ask yourself, are we doing the things right now that are meaty and relentless on executing on our passionate vision? Are we doing the right things to lead this great redirect of where our organization needs to be to be relevant in the future? So let me go through uh, some different categories and some things that we have seen Bankshire Size doing today. We think it's good stuff. We see it working and taking root. So first one, lead your channel strategy. Don't observe channels. Don't talk about every customer can have any channel they want. Lead, decide what hard choices to make. So first, build a channel scorecard and reveal to all your stakeholders, here's what's happening in our channels today. Um, don't just do that at the top of the house. Look at every branch. And look at your branch portfolio and say, where do we have low performing branches? Close them, move them, reduce the size of them. Start that redirect now. Don't wait till it's too late. And negotiate contracts. Keep talking about where do we free up dollars that we can invest on the right side of the ledger. Now understand though, what is the value of a branch? And I think a lot of community bankers and credit unions would say this. The branch gives the customer in our market a feeling of trust. It's not like uh, I have to go to an application to find it. When they drive by and the lights are on intentionally at night, they see us in the marketplace. It's something, and I buy into that. Vernon Hill at, at Commerce Bank was the one who created the idea about keeping the lights on at night to show that we are in the town, we're vibrant, we're alive. Um, it is a big billboard now, but it isn't a billboard that houses transactions. It's a big billboard that houses salespeople, outbound salespeople, anytime salespeople. And if you think about it, this is the way I look at it, you're going to have to sit those darn people somewhere, whether they're a business banker or a mortgage originator or investment rep, they got to sit somewhere. Might as well sit them under our billboards and, and optimize our occupancy cost. But build the talent management around that idea that we've got a sales force that uses that, but they may be going outbound quite a bit. And really build that channel roadmap to decide what are we going to do first, second, and third in terms of our, our different technology investments, branch investments. The other thing we'd ask you to do is go forth and really think hard about your marketing function, the way you do marketing. And there's not a bank in the country that right now, including Chase or B of A, doesn't need to further upgrade and enhance the digital and social marketing skills and the resources that are tied to that. This cannot be Jared, the kid from the community college who comes in part time while the rest of us do traditional marketing. This is about a complete change out in what's important within your marketing department. So, you know, a key quiz, who is the whiz in your marketing department today that every time there's a social breakout at the CSI conference or a newsletter or something is diving into the world of web and mobile analytics, diving into best practices in social, uh, diving into new ways to, to buy media and things like YouTube and other places, and who are your agencies and partners that really don't just talk about this, they really get this. And I'd ask you to think about where are we positioned today, marketing department and those type of skills and agencies and partners that we use today. And think about right now in terms of what is a quick ROI is really start getting serious about the personalization or the contextualization of all those eyeballs that come in through internet banking and mobile banking every week, every month at our bank. The big banks are great at this. You come on in and they, they know who you are, they know your relationships with the bank and they give you a contextual offer right there. The credit unions are getting very good at this in some respects, some of the large credit unions. The community banks and, and regional banks are still very poor at this. They may have one static banner ad sitting there that gets nobody's attention. And it is a, it, this is the new way we engage customers is getting better at context uh, and things like that. And there are all kinds of ways we can use technology in a personal manner uh, to drive adoption, to drive engagement. And I'll give you an example. Uh, I had a, 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 an organization that does a lot of indirect lending. They've got a process now where when that indirect le loan closes, they get the email at the dealer of the new customer. When, uh, then they send an email with a video, uh, an interactive video, 
that comes out encouraging them to sign up for auto pay. And literally within the screens of the video, they can click on enrollment and go right into a landing page, enroll their auto pay information. They're getting a 70% hit rate on borrowers signing up through this video for auto pay. And what are they doing at the exact same time with those eyeballs? They're talking about their money market special and their checking account and their credit card and they're trying to engage more of that uh, and they're getting better take rates on that than any direct marketing program that they could do to the same customers after the fact. New ways to engage that are more effective and I would say we are very lulled into thinking about outbound calling as white shoe salesmen and do not call lists and the famous line of most of our board members, I hate telemarketers. I do too, they're a bunch of idiots. Uh, if you haven't seen the, uh, the cable company viral video out on the web about this eight minute conversation with a commissioned uh, cable guy not letting a consumer cancel his subscription, you, you realize where that brand came from. But I'm here to tell you when it's done in the right way as an onboarding call, thank you for the loan, wanted to make sure everything uh, went good, did you get the video, are you signed up for auto pay, hey did you know? And by the way, we've got that credit information so we know you also have another loan over at Chase and we can actually save you money, would you like to light that candle? I can send you out a loan, we can close that with an e-signature, we can get this done right now. When we start thinking about those kind of conversations that are more win-win, that are more tied to personalized information, that are smart conversations, I got to tell you, the uptake that we find in our client base is very good. And so as people don't come to the branches, we're going to have to get serious about that stuff. How do we engage and reach out to our customers and do it in the right kind of ways? We're going to have to be armed with information about them, armed with very clear things about why we're calling them and what the value proposition is for the two minutes or three minutes of their time. But it can be done and it is being done right now. We think about your commercial folks the lenders, the business bankers. Uh, I like to call them relationship managers because it keeps things focused, not on just credit. But right now, we've got to look at our trusted advisors and arm them with technology. So as, as Steve mentioned this morning, the new trusted advisor is going to be armed with the tablet. They're going to be not complaining about your IT department's virtual private network and how hard it is, and it's impossible to work at home. Um, we're going to force our relationship managers to engage in the world of social media because as was mentioned by a breakout I went to with, with Eric, uh, that's how we're going to do our touch program going forward. Hey, on LinkedIn, I saw this article. I think you might like it. Um, this is the new way of the touch program and centers of influence networking that we've been doing since we went through credit trading, but we've got to put that on steroids and put it with new uh, technology. CRM is the holy grail. It was uh, in the early caveman days. It was in the late 1800s. It still is in 2014, this, this holy grail. But I think uh, the folks at CSI have kind of taken the approach, let's get some pragmatic things that we can use. Uh, there's other players out there starting to, you know, Salesforce and others starting to weave their way into banking. But our take there is keep it pragmatic. And one thing we like to use as a rule, you're never going to get Bert, the loan officer, to buy into CRM. If you give him a process devised by somebody in a staff department who doesn't do actual lending or relationship management, uh, a process that'll take Bert 11 minutes to fill out a darn call sheet, I like to use the three minute rule. If Bert can't enter his call in three minutes, the CRM program is too complex. Are, are we having those kind of debates? Keeping the calling very simple. But I gotta tell you, uh, we cannot let Bert lead us into never doing anything about Salesforce automation or contact management or information more than just getting that loan closed. How much should we be funding that loan with deposits? Why aren't they signed up with our treasury management products? How come no one in wealth management has talked to them about their 401k or the owner's own in, uh, registered investment accounts? Uh, we can't let Bert win that argument. We just have to understand we've got some design specs to meet to get Bert uh, to be forced uh, to adopt it. And when we think about flat revenue growth and unlimited competition and people saying we're overpaid, you know, I do think now is the time to put teeth into the profitability side of our cultures. Again, the very first month I was in banking, we were implementing a customer profitability system. It was called CRISP back then. If you have any bankers, um, didn't work like most profitability systems. But 
it really is time to put teeth into that. And, and I think in the future, if I was running a bank, I would try to pay my relationship managers incentives more based on their revenue growth and the income they're producing versus just the volume. We still talk about volume way too much in this industry. You know, I could go on forever about payments and I don't have all the answers, nobody does. I was talking to some of the folks at CSI this morning at breakfast about payments who run that area, you know, and nobody has the answers. But I think it's important we monitor the threat assessment, how fast is NFC and other things being uptake. You need some type of intelligence at least twice a year on what's moving there. Watch things like uh, self-checkout and online sales, because that may be where a lot of merchants start to grow and then they jump into the physical world. Uh, there's a term out there called tokenization that became a big hit on, uh, on Google the minute Apple came out. Every banker needs to understand tokenization. Who's ever running payments at your bank needs to start talking about what is our tokenization roadmap. Uh, and there are folks at CSI who can explain that to you. I think it's very, very important. But while people like uh, PayPal and Amazon and Apple start to vie for where is payments going to shake out, there's a couple things we can do this morning, this afternoon. Uh, we can ro redouble our efforts to have a very slick mobile banking experience. So whatever card gets put into what wallet, the banking account for now remains with us. And to do that, we need to add capabilities like better bill pay. A big one right now is card self-service through mobile banking. So I can set limits on card transactions, type of card transactions. As very famous with the folks at Malazai, I can turn off my debit card if I want to, a great little feature. That kind of self-service is very important. And tied to that is just ask yourself, are we blowing our customers away with how we service their payments accounts? When they want to hot card something or dispute something or ask a question, are we proactively, as mentioned, educating them on fraud? Blow them away as the we have your back trusted advisor, and that will help forestall them taking that offer from a Square or an Amazon or an Apple to kind of fire their bank and go to something that's more uh, coupled in the future with what they're offering. We want to stick our wallets in those things, our, our account numbers in there, but we have to give a great experience to hold folks back. And it's just like the old days when you'd go to the cash register and the person at May Company or Lord & Taylor would say, would you like our card? You get 5% more off today. If you were loyal enough to that company and that bank and that card, you'd say, no thanks, the 5% is not worth another card in my wallet. Same thinking here. And recognize even with Apple Pay, EMV marches on. We can't change the whole uh, payment ecosystem uh, before EMV has to be put in. So both things will coexist. In fact, one thing to watch is that merchants may put EMV and NFC into their terminals at the same time, kind of a might as well do it uh, all at the same time, and look for a lot of that in 15 and especially early 16. And last slide for you guys. Um, I, don't think, I was a finance MBA who grew up in credit. Uh, many of you came from the lending side, the, the risk side, the IT and ops side, the finance side. We all have to change a little bit of our, our heads and a lot of our executive airtime around customer experience because that is where we compete. And so change the way your team talks about this. Get some metrics to the top of the house, more than just one satisfaction score or one net promoter score. Think about what other metrics around retention, attrition, uh, a share of wallet 90 days after onboarding. Um, dig into the data that you can get from surveys. Uh, we have clients who have gotten very mature with what they call their voice of the customer process. And they can tell you what branches have the worst comments and why. They can tell you the top three things they're trying to beat up their internet and mobile vendor about because of the feedback they're getting. They're constantly reviewing social media and things like Apple Store app comments. So they're very tied to that. And really set priorities. Again, as I mentioned before, any good CEO and executive team right now would have, here are the top three processes that touch our customers that we have to fix in 2015. And if it requires a new system, some training, a new policy, I want a project plan, I want deadlines, I want next to choke. This is as important as the next merger we do. This is as important as the production we do. Uh, I think we all have to change that mojo and that mindset a bit. And that is because, just like Mr. Dillon saying the times are changing, just like that crazy bass player Getty Lee that brought me in, 
Uh, this is kind of like rock and roll. We like to cause trouble in the CSI customer base. We don't like to sit and observe big box and out of industry disruptors take the whole narrative around what is the future of banking. We like to be troublemakers. And I think what's really important is uh, we support you guys. We're on a mission to help and work with troublemakers as is CSI. I applaud what they're, they're doing here and think about it. CSI is a troublemaker because if you'd asked Fiserv and Jack Henry and Systematics back then and EDS back then in the 90s, they would have said somebody like CSI will not exist in 2014. I guarantee you I could have won kidneys from people at those companies in 1998 if I bet there would be a CSI of this size with 800 attendees in Orlando in 2014. Uh, you are a disruptor CSI with, with these troublemakers here. So I just ask you, like Jack Welch says, go passionately own the vision and relentlessly work on execution around a lot of new stuff that's not comfortable to us, not in running the bank, but in changing the bank. Go make trouble, you guys.